Hello everyone, my name is Dan Pagan. I'm a lighting compositing artist for anime, uh, for Nickelodeon Animation Studios. And today we're gonna to be discussing a little bit about my career and in here in Breaking the Biz Podcast. Stay tuned for today's episode of Breaking the Biz, an informative podcast where we dive into the world of entertainment by interviewing seasoned professionals who have made their mark in the industry. Gain invaluable insights as they share their personal journeys, offering advice on navigating the dynamic landscape of the entertainment industry. Whether you're an aspiring actor, musician, filmmaker, author, animator, or any creative soul, Tune in for expert career guidance, insider tips, and first-hand accounts on breaking into the entertainment industry. Get ready to unlock the secrets behind successful careers and fuel your own passion for the limelight. Please remember to like this video and to subscribe to our channels for more great conversations. Greetings from Breaking the Biz, brought to you by Yes I Can, Unity through Music and Education. I'm William Felber, your navigator through the intriguing universe of the entertainment industry, as revealed by the visionaries and creators who bring it to life. Stay tuned as we delve into diverse insights from the forefront of entertainment, hearing from pioneers, creators, and agents of change. Prepare for a journey filled with tales of innovation, resilience, and the undying quest for artistic brilliance. I want to thank everyone for being right on time. Like Sam mentioned, he's a compositing artist at Nickelodeon Animation Studios. Uh, he is initially, he was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, growing up on the island gave him lots of exposure to nature and adventure. Therefore, he became fascinated with outdoor activities like camping, soccer, swimming, kayaking. And because of this in his craft, uh, he works on all projects that illustrate the exhilarating feeling of adventure involving magic, action, and explosions. Uh, to date, he's worked on several animated shows, including the rebooted Rugrats, the eagerly anticipated Star Trek Prodigy, an Emmy-nominated uh, series, Fanto, uh, The Phantomville. Uh, he's worked on live-action films such as Polaroid, uh, his work has been featured internationally across industries such as museums, academia, fashion contest organizations, faith-based organizations, and food producers. Uh, he wants to give back to the next generation of animation artists. Uh, he holds his own podcast, the Sam Pagan Podcasts, where he shares bits of wisdom and advice from his experience as a professional on the field. Absolutely amazing that uh, he is here uh, to give us that inside knowledge as well. So, Sam, I want to thank you for uh, making time for us tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Awesome. So let's talk uh, your early days. Um, were you the student in school who was drawing everything and not paying attention, but at the same time, everyone saw your talent? No, uh, I'm a I'm a late bloomer. Art was not involved in my childhood. I was more involved into sports and music. I was a clarinet player for ten years, and uh, I I was not associated with drawing or sculpting or stuff like that. But I did have an interest in in how movie how animated movies look like like oh the graphics the rendering that was something that i really admired but i uh at the beginning i never saw myself in this career in fact somebody told me when i was in 2012 hey like there's this animation thing like what do you be interested in that and i said never i would never make it you have to be born an artist you have to be born drawing from the womb of your mother uh, for you to be able to be in the animation industry. Funny enough, 10 years later, I'm a Nickelodeon. I'm like, well, joke's on me. So that's funny. Now, that's, that, it, it, that is kind of one of those perceived notions that um, all artists that are animators and fantastic, amazing artists just were kind of born with that skill. And you, you mentioned something interesting because you think of like, Kobe Bryant and some of these basketball players who just become amazing athletes. And some of them uh, don't really start playing that sport until, uh, you know, high school. 
but it's those individuals who put in the hours and put in the time working on their craft that become those amazing athletes or those amazing artists. So if you weren't, you know, drawing initially, um, when did, when did that switch kick? And then we're going to talk about how much time you've put into your craft to get you into the door of uh, Nickelodeon. Right. Uh, well, in 2012, I started engineering. Uh, I thought I was going to be an engineer and it seems like calculus wasn't friendly to me. So it made me quit. In fact, after that, I changed careers five times. I studied English literature and then I went to Canada, studied French, and then I came back to Puerto Rico and studied uh, cinematography. I, I went broke. And then I went to this cheaper school where I could study um, graphic design. And that it was in 2015, I'm studying graphic design uh, in the metro area of Puerto Rico. And finally, I see somebody like doing a, a 3D animation. And just like somebody rotating, I remember somebody rotating a character in 3D. It was like a, I, I, it was a chibi Iron Man. And I remember like, oh, if I could do like an Iron Man in 3D, that would be amazing. And I saw like that, but in Chibi and from a professor, I was like, okay, it's done. <laughs> that's what I want to do. So that's that's how it sparked uh, my, my curiosity to get into animation. Okay. And then let's talk about uh, schooling. Um, when you were in school, did you learn compositing in 3D animation? I, I love the fact that A... You went through all these different things that you wanted to do, and it just shows you, you do not need to settle if it's not something that really makes you happy. Right. That's exactly right. I think uh, you got to find your own wiring, what makes you kick. Remember that this is a decision of a lifetime. It's not like, oh, let's get some gigs, I get some money and get out. It's not that kind of thing. It's a lifestyle. It's a, of a lifetime. So if you're going to do something worthwhile, you might as well enjoy it. So I did all of that because I was very naive and didn't know like much about the world. I didn't make my research. And I'm one of those people that I just, I, I throw myself in to explore and I'm not afraid to hit myself with some bumps and some financial situations just to see, uh, figure out what I want to do. And that was a situation, of course, um, uh, even though I do come from a low income family, my family did support me with, you know, staying at their place and transportation and, and food. So that that's very beneficial for me. And I got and they were very supportive. So that's that's a really plus from that. That is not under my control. But uh, but I would do anything just to to get things right. And when I got into animation, you know, I wanted to. I promised myself I was not going to watch series. I was not going to play video games. I was going to be at the library uh, studying until, uh, unt and this was a promise that I actually kept. My promise was I was going to be, since the university starts, like at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., until it closes. And I was very known by the security guard because he was the one closing the gates, and I was always the one where they close also the gates of the parking lot. And I would have to ask him, hey, can you open it again? Like, <laughs> my car is inside again. So um, discipline does uh, matter a lot. And the desire to 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 go beyond uh, everyone else is very important, especially in this career. I love how you mentioned that being the first one in and the last one out. Um, and it, it also really shows a lot about your character the resilience that you have and the focus and the determination, the goal setting. I love the fact of setting a goal to be the first one in there and the last one out, or just, you know, following the hours of school, maximizing it uh, and going above and beyond what everyone else is doing. When you are trying to get into a field that is highly competitive, uh, there are people that are going to try to outwork you. And having that mindset um, that you have, Sam, that you're going to outwork everyone else is what opens up for success. There was also something that you said that resonated with me was you don't mind having a few bumps and bruises along the road as long as you're learning. 
And that's the only way you can learn. Sometimes you have to go through different careers to go, this is not what I want to do. Sometimes the careers that you do early on still come back and those skill sets are used. I imagine that there's a lot of engineering skills that you still apply to computer and 3D animation and compositing uh, where you don't necessarily need to deal with calculus. And uh, I, I totally understand having that <laughs> class that makes you go, wait a minute, if this is you know a big part of the job and I hate this, chances are I might hate my job. So um, I love that. So you, you put in all those hours, you study, you study. Uh, talk me through finding a job uh, out of college. Right. So I was very blessed that after working so much, I was very known in the university and I, and I, I wanted to make something different in my university, which was get a group of people and do animations besides the homework and what the classes require us. So I got to, I got to be around 13 people where, or, and more sometimes where we would do short films and compete in festivals and stuff like that. And because of that, we were very known in, in the university because we were breaking the norm. Uh, most people are just, they just do the class and they leave the university. Us, we were like, sometimes we had meetings at 6 a.m. before classes. And sometimes we had meetings like until 12 at night because we were the ones, the, the rebellious ones who were like, we're not going to conform just like everyone else. We're going to do... Uh, more than that so i was going with this can you repeat the question yeah no 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 uh, uh where you're where you're going with it um just kind of I, I i have to point out some stuff and then i'll rephrase the question but um i love that you are a disruptor and i mean that in the kindest way possible people who are disruptors make change um for the good and you think like of an elon musk and the you know the electric cars and pushing that um, you got to disrupt the whole industry. The fact that you disrupted uh, the education, so to speak, like everyone goes to college, they have to go jump through the hoops. They usually play the game, get the degree, and then they're out. I love mm -hmm. that you kind of showed that leadership skills too and got a group of students to go above and beyond and create and enter uh film festivals and, and animation festivals and showcase your work. The other thing that I wanted to point out was it's okay to be known as that student who works hard. Like, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, I'm sure your hard work and dedication was noticed more than just the security guard, right? Like <laughs> people at that school know your leadership, know that who, there's obviously someone who's making the group get together at 6 a.m., for a meeting or meeting at midnight and getting stuff done. So mm -hmm. um, I, I love that. My question was how quickly or how, you know, how does it work as far as completing your school and then getting your first job uh, in, you know, in the industry? Yeah, I, I knew why, why I was bringing that story. So because of that, because of, we were recognized, uh, this, there was a company uh, in, in the metro area where the the same, uh, somewhat of the same connections that were at the university also worked there, and they wanted the thirteen of us to work at the studio. So they hired the thirteen of us when we graduated, and they gave us they first gave us an internship, and then they gave us full time jobs, and until this day, that was in two thousand seven. The our internship was in two thousand seventeen. In two thousand eighteen, it was our full-time job and until today which is 2024 uh some of them are still there like probably half of the group is still there uh and 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 that was due to the to all the actions and all the stories that 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 little group did in, in those years so uh the the lesson here is hard work never goes unnoticed and even though I didn't go through the application and it was more networking, they knew who we were. Uh, and it was, a they, the, there was also a, a lot, uh, 
a certain amount of luck and timing. They just needed uh, to make a series for TV. And we had, we, we had all the skills that they needed, the company. So I was a compositor and BFX. So nobody does that in my group other than me. So they hired me. There was somebody who was interested in rigging. Uh, her name is Yachira, and uh, she's still a rigger, a professional rigger today. And and uh, she was hired too. Like my my friend Jesus, my, like uh, my friend Paula, Luis, like all these people. Uh, they it was just so convenient that everyone had their own specialty, and the company just hired everyone and uh, took us in. So let's just so everyone really can grasp this. It's not too common that a company just swoops up internships and getting jobs for an entire group. So Sam, first of all, put together an eclectic group where everyone had their specialties. Uh, we're going to talk about this later on in the year, but collaboration, that's how it works. You want to have people who are just as talented and hungry as you who have different skill sets. So the areas that you might lack, someone else might have that skill set. So as Sam was talking about compositing and lighting, rigor, obviously, and Sam can get into this more because this is his his specialty. But, you know, how the characters move, you know, I imagine is with rigging. Right. So there's all of these different skill sets that all come together. Um, talk me through how long uh, was your internship? Did you say a year? My first, in, our first internship was a summer internship, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. It was like two or three months. And then uh, we went back to school. And then a year later, we graduated. Am I having the timeline right? No, you're so. fine. And then from there. And then from there, we were just. And everyone time. got jobs. Got it. Yes. I, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. it. So uh, what was the biggest lesson learned uh, as in, you know, in an internship, we always are very pro internships. Um, not all internships turn into job placement, but when right. indeed you're a hard worker and you're part of the company morale and you learn and you become an asset, uh, that your chances of being hired are most definitely looking good. Um, I want to know what was the biggest lesson that you learned personally in that internship? Collaboration, communication, and, you know, practice versus reality. There's a very big difference between university and, and the business. In university, the, the focus is you. Like, you have to be developed. You are, it's your short films, is your uh, creativity. But in business, it's not about you. It's about the the product so if we're making a, a commercial a animated commercial it's not what you like it's what probably the director and the client likes so you just you're just the hands and i think my biggest mistake has been assuming that it was the same thing that uh the being the the, the experience of the university which was all focused on my creativity was the same thing as the business which is it's all about them. You're there in the service business. You're there to serve. And uh, it took me uh, it took me a while, a pretty long while to understand that I'm just a service provider. And the joy is more into providing service and being efficient and 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 productive rather than satisfying your own need of I want to be creative. That's uh, that could happen, but it's mostly you're there to serve. You know, and that's a great point that you're making, right? The the client, the director, the studio, which you're working for, if you're a freelancer, if you're hired there at the studio, bottom line, you are creating what you're being told to create. You have to deal with constructive criticism. If it's not what they want, you just got to keep changing it until you finally get it. I imagine there's lots of changes, lots of different people coming in. And I loved how you mentioned you are there to do a service. Most yeah. uh, most freelance jobs are in uh, in service industry, even in the entertainment industry. So um, let's talk about your transition. You the what the project that you guys worked on. You said you worked on a on a short there. 
um, when you guys got hired? Yeah, we worked uh, many things. Uh, when you're in a small studio, they tend to uh, have all sorts of projects. Like, for example, and that's, in fact, that's a big difference between a big company like Nickelodeon and uh, a, a small studio, which is uh, the big one. You'll probably just work in one show for three years. In this case, Rugrats. In a small company, you, they switch you around all the time. So you get, uh, I did a couple of commercials, a, sh a live action short film, a commercial for a museum, uh, probably some typography. Oh, I did some logo motion, motion design. Uh, I did some light, I did lighting, a lot of lighting. I did a, a lot of compositing. So the same person can be switched around because that's the tendency of a small studio. They, they have various clients with different needs. So that's what I got to do there. With, and let me ask you, uh, when you're working on these smaller projects and diverse projects, are you allowed to use part of the project into your demo or your reel to showcase your work? I'm just curious what it was uh, that you used to get your foot in the door in Nickelodeon. Right. Yes, they, they, they let you. At least it's culturally the norm. Uh, as long as it has been published. And if it's commercial work and if it's small projects, they tend to be at least released less in less than a year. So that's a very good benefit. So the benefit for me was that the lighting and the compositing that I was working, it was released six months after I did it. So it was just in time for me to use that work and apply to Nickelodeon and finally have the lighting job that, that I wanted. So, but let's reverse that. Sometimes if, if you want to do it from a big studio, uh, a movie can take, or a series can take three years. So if you start at year one, you won't see your work until like it's published, which is like three years later. It's insane. Yeah. So um, are you, do you have the ability to share with us uh, your demo reel? Is yeah, of course. You, yeah. Let's, let's see that. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. You don't realize how much coloring changes are, you know, are going on. There you go. Super cool. I love it. So you, you're able to use some of these projects that you're doing at the studio. You put it into a reel. How did you find uh, the job opening at Nickelodeon? So give me a second. Uh, my audio is, <laughs> my audio in my computer went nuts. Okay, now I'm back. You're good. So the, can you repeat the question? I got, fo I lost focus. Sh sure. Um, how did you find the job? Uh, for Nickelodeon? Was that something posted? Was it from a friend networking? Um, obviously, Nickelodeon is one of those, you know, studios that everyone would love to be a part of. Of course. Uh, they have something called a Nick Artist Program. In fact, what is today? July 2nd? In fact, they just started applications, in fact. Uh, in July of every year, today is July 2nd, uh, in July of every year, they open... Uh, 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 for submissions for you to apply to the NICOS program. And it's a program designed for people that are starting off. They would, they want to break into the industry and they go into an interview process for around four months ish where uh, you showcase your portfolio. And if you've pa those who pass that round, get in, into an interview and after that interview, you, if you pass that interview, then you get into the final interview where all the staff of Nickelodeon basically <laughs> um, 
interviews you. Like imagine a screen like ours, but like with 20 people and everyone has a question for you. That was the process that I went through. And it's called lightning rounds. Everyone just asks you, so how do you do, deal with deadlines? So how do you deal with this? And t t t tell us about your technical approach in compositing and da 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 So that, in that situation, you have to be really good uh, on your feet, uh, especially, especially uh, communicating verbally. So I did my best uh, to do that. And I had uh, a good feeling that I was doing good. I think it was one of my best interviews ever. And uh, and to my surprise, after the five finalists, I got to be the 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 person they picked, and I was very fortunate to once I was picked to get to Los Angeles and and work in their studio. I uh, I love that you talked about the lightning interview. Uh, we talk about you know different kinds of interview. The the days of going in handshake and sitting there face to face doesn't always happen, especially in a virtual world where everything technology is moving so quickly. Uh, the fact of having an interview through Zoom or, a, a, you know, a Google Meets uh, is could happen. And, um, you know, you mentioned you go through rounds and then when you get to that final round and they're about to invest a lot of money into someone, everyone wants to make sure that they green light and give the thumbs up. So having 20, you know, 20 different people shooting questions at you, uh, that's a reality. Is it great that you don't have to necessarily uh, deal with the stress and the sweat and be sitting in the hot chair, you know, with all these people uh, doing an interview? At least you're in, you know, your own comfort zone, so to speak, behind the screen. But just like you mentioned, you have to be quick uh, with answering your questions, a little bit different style of an interview. So I love that you do it. You then moved to Los Angeles, right? Is that what you shared? Yes. Um, yes. And you, you get the job. Talk me through working. And you said the first project was Rugrats. Were yes. you a, Were you a big fan of Rugrats before this? Like, is this one of those dream? Like, obviously, Nickelodeon is the dream studio. But is it dream studio and you're getting to work on a dream project? I wish that was the case. I wish that was the case that I I I I was more uh cultured but no uh fortunately I was I was raised almost without TV uh because of different reasons uh one of them was economic reasons like my parents didn't want to have cable TV just to save uh money uh so I was always the one like watching the same DVDs or the same cassettes and uh, and if I had to watch uh, anything from Nickelodeon, like Avatar, The Last Airbender, maybe Rugrats and uh, uh, Power. How what was that show? Power or something? Power Rangers? No, it's like the skateboarders. Uh, I'll remember sometimes. Rock <laughs> Power. Sponge, rock Power. There you go. <laughs> Damn. Uh, then. It would be because I was at an, uh, a neighbor's house, a, a cousin of mine's house, and I would be hypnotized with those cartoons because that was the only chance I had to watch uh, TV. So uh, when I went to Rugrats, I know of it, and 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 I never thought anything like other than that's pretty cool. But I didn't know really well the story, didn't understand what was going on. So as I'm working in the show, I learn the names, I learn what it's about, and I go, and then I watch the animatics and the storyboards and I go like, Oh, okay. Wow. This is actually really funny. And, uh, and then I learn about regrets by Love it. doing it. Perfect. So you're, you're at Nickelodeon. Uh, you're working on Rugrats, uh, compositing. What comes next after Rugrats? Well, while I was at Rugrats, there was an opportunity, like a two month opportunity to work at Star Trek prodigy, uh, which I would just do like a very minimal, assistance like uh providing some assets solving some problems in, in for the fx team and um and i got to experience another thing they they just needed a couple of hands for service and that's why i i preach about that it's more about service and not creativity i was just there to serve and uh and i tried to accommodate myself into the into their pipeline and their way of working and then when the contract was done then 
uh, I return back to Rugrats and that's how Nickelodeon works. They they can switch you around, uh, do some freelancing between shows and, and stuff like that. And, and you get to work with different teams. I love it. So talking about working with different teams, um, how important has networking been to your success? A hundred percent. Um, so while I was at Nickelodeon, they have a really good, well, at least the Nick Arts program, I, I can only speak about my experience, but the Nick Arts program specifically, they had a program designed for you to network. What they would do on a weekly basis, they would make us reach out to other people, directors, writers, who, whoever in the company, uh, and have virtual, what they call virtual coffees. And we would have to email them. We would have to say a thank you email and not only like email them, but they would like the Nick Arts program staff would review our, our emailing and teach us about techniques on how to make it uh, more engaging, more cordial, and, and also like push us to, you know, to tell us that that was acceptable uh, behavior. So doing six months of that, I got to meet a lot of people. And because of that habit, I kept going. I don't know if the rest of the Nick Arts people still do it, but uh, for a whole year I after the Nick Arts program, I kept doing 20 minute virtual coffees. I would ask for people, hey, can we do a 20 minute virtual coffee inside of Nickelodeon? And they would say yes. And I would meet uh, directors or people from the department and I would ask them like, what would what would they do? And then I would learn more about the pipeline. And it was on those conversations actually, without looking any any on my interest, where like three times I was offered a job, just of a casual conversation where I wanted to meet up and talk about cats or something. And uh, and then we would have like talk about coincidences, like, oh, do you know this person? And da, 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 da. oh, you worked with this person that you must be good. You know what? We're looking for somebody. Why, uh, will you be interested? And I was like, well, I wasn't working, looking for a job, although my contract is almost ending, but sure, I'm down for an interview. And uh, and I remember like one of those shows actually got me in. And the first day that it started, unfortunately, uh, the, the position was canceled uh, because they were gonna remake the whole show again and they needed to focus on something else in pre-production. So my position wasn't available at the time. But um, that experience, that gave me the, the whole picture of why networking is important because it is in those face-to-face -face interactions where, where people build trust. And the principle of business, because this is a business, is trust. If there is no trust in your capacities, in your attitude towards life, like, oh, Sam has a good attitude. I like him. In fact, because I like him, I want him in my team. In fact, nobody hires because they, if you're unlikable, like they hire, they hire you because you're likable. They like how you are as a person and they trust you. That's a very, that's the base of business. So if you follow those principles, you'll have what you get. And for more evidence, I try, I did this virtual coffee thing outside of Nickelodeon. And to my surprise, it even brought me more opportunities. Like I would talk to people at Pixar. I would talk to people in Blizzard. I would talk, I even went to the BFX industry, which is not my industry, but I would talk with the BFX industry and they would get me interviews and like in 24 hours, they would get me a, an interview. So once you unlock that knowledge that you can talk to people, make yourself known and see if there's an opportunity, you say, okay, I understand the game now. I just have to consistently do this. I think it's fascinating uh, your route of networking. Some people always say networking is so stressful, right? And, you know, we always think about taking the business cards and walking around in a circle and having to meet people face to face. But the 20 minutes, the 10 minute cough, virtual coffee is such a great idea because 
in the end, it really is a informational uh, interview where you're trying to learn, uh, you know, and you're not going into it asking for a job. You, you know, nowhere on there it, does it say like uh, uh, looking to be hired, right? You're mm-hmm. just at, you, you like you mentioned, you're learning more about the pipeline. You're learning more about different jobs. You're meeting other people. And I could not agree with you more that in this business, it's all about trust and being likable. And if right off the bat, we can go, ah, talented, likable, trustworthy, going to get deadlines and mature soul, right? Mm-hmm. Be part of my team. So it's absolutely fascinating. But some of you might be going, well, I don't work at Nickelodeon. How can I get these, you know, 20 minute things? We have LinkedIn where amazing artists are are listed on LinkedIn. You can reach out and ask for, uh, you know, a 10 minute virtual coffee experience and just share that you love their work and would love to learn more um, about their career roadmap. Obviously, there's people like Sam that are willing to pay it forward and share their journey and how they got there and offer advice and connections and relationships. And you're hearing firsthand that just from setting up a 20 minute meeting or a 10 minute meeting, uh, Sam got three or four different job opportunities. So uh, you have to put in the time, you have to network, and you can do networking in your own comfort environment. Uh, just by, if you watch a show, let's say it's Rugrats and you love Rugrats, reach out to the director, reach out to who's doing the rigging, the compositing, uh, the animation, who's the uh, the supervisor, right? Uh, so get out of your comfort zone. I absolutely love that. Talk to me about mentor, Sam. Is there a mentor that comes to mind for you? Obviously, you have no problem mentoring others. But is there someone that you can still go to and talk to uh, if indeed you need advice? I, right now I'm following someone, but it's not in part, it's not part of the animation industry. It's, uh, it's the business world. For the past year and a half, I've been building my own business, uh, educational business. And there's this person that makes content online that I've been obsessed with because everything that I have needed to learn about life, about business, about careers, I've learned it with this person and I would highly recommend uh, to, to listen to him. His name is Alex Hermosi. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about him, but he's very big in the business world. And what I like is that everything that he talks about business principles, you as an artist can use it to your advantage. Like uh, what is value, how, uh, the importance of communication, uh, how, like how to make yourself more appealing to, to a company. How do markets work? Like, for example, something that in the animation industry is not talked about is about markets. There is... And the animation world alone, there is obviously the obvious ones, the 3D one, the, the, the 3D market, the 2D market. But inside the 2D, you can have, in fact, yeah, in both mediums, you can have the preschool market. What's the preschool market? Things like Dora the Explorer, Santiago of the Seas, uh, Pocoyo, those kind of, those kind of animations if you have a if you have a portfolio that aims to the preschool market the likelihood that they'll hire you is higher and uh that conversation has never been talked because us artists we're not very um we haven't developed a language about that kind of of business where you're like oh the art style yeah the art style but our style attracts different audiences and if it attracts different audiences you have to ask yourself why well if, if they attack okay so if they attract different audiences the why could be the more realistic they look they tend to be for more grown-ups and if it the, the more simplistic and the more geometric and the and the more saturated colors they tend to be uh for 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 younger kids 
if that's the case, do you think the art style for realism is the same scale as simplification and geometric uh, stylization? So just knowing your audience, right? Knowing what you're working with. Exactly. Because those skills are very different. I cannot work. For example, my portfolio, <laughs> my portfolio doesn't work for the BFX industry. In that market, it doesn't work because the lighting they expect from me is 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 more into the realistic side of things. It's the realistic side of things, where my portfolio showcases none of that. My it says for TV for animation for TV, and for animated commercials. That's what my demo reel gets me and every time i apply to those kind of things that's the ones who, who say yes and the other ones say no if i wanted to work for a disney feature for example i cannot go with this reel i have to go into a more where it's more cinematic and those are very very uh buzzwords that m people might not understand what it is but if you go in, in depth into it and you you see how cinema does lighting is really different from TV. TV has to be efficient. It has to be appealing. And off we go. <laughs> There's no time. We got to do like a whole season. But for feature, it has to be a masterpiece of, of, of lighting where they go, they, they, they call it sh per shot basis. Every shot has to be masterful. And that is the standard of, of a feature film. So going back to where I'm going is that uh, if you get to listen to someone like Alex Ramosi that you talk about markets and stuff like that, that is a mentor that I've, I've, I have in my heart, that also explains how you can apply to a, to a studio because you understand business principles. Love it. Makes total sense. I have one last question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to the students if they have questions. So students start thinking about those questions. Um, my question, last question to you is, with all that you have learned in your career and your lifetime, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to a younger Sam? Uh, don't be so stubborn. Elaborate on that. Because we all can get in our own way and we can all be stubborn. I I have a tendency. To, I, 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 I'm much, I, I don't think, no, I'm still a little bit stubborn. Um, back in the day and, you know, my first studio, my, my, my first company can, can blame me on this. <laughs> I wanted to make good work. Right. And maybe like there's no time. And I would be stubborn and say, no, like it has to be good. And just that stubbornness to make it good would cause the team problems. I wish I had understood that earlier, that the the point is the I don't see the macro, I don't see the big picture. So for me, I was doing great, but uh, now as a more mature person, I can say, no, this is a business. You're there to serve. Don't be so stubborn. Just, just make yourself useful to the team. And, 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 and if they say simplify, don't overcomplicate, they don't overcomplicate. Uh, I wish I had understood that earlier and I would take, uh, I, I would, I would encourage my younger self to just be a better listener to to not just understand but to change behavior like sometimes I think we 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 confuse that that uh understanding that understanding that you have to network is not the same thing as changing your behavior and actually network like yeah networking is important yeah you understand why but have you learned have you have you changed your behavior and um and if you just understand it but you don't change your behavior then you haven't learned anything so um i wish i knew that i wish i i had been more mature and 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 not be so stubborn and be a better listener and say more like i am wrong and 
uh, you are right and maybe give more chance to other people's advice to say, let me give it a second. <laughs> maybe you are right. right. And uh, I wish I had done that earlier because I would then be more ahead of my career where um, many instances uh, I, I would have done better decisions. Okay. I love it. I want to thank you for your time. I know we uh, we agreed upon an hour, and I'm going to keep to it. Uh, Sam, you are fantastic. You've got a strong growth mindset. You're a great example uh, for individuals who are hungry to get into this industry. I think your advice goes beyond just animation and in and, and that realm. Uh, the, the life advice that you have shared tonight is priceless. Um, it's so right on. Networking is needed. Finding a mentor is needed. Uh, your example of hard work always pays off and people take notice to those who work hard and don't slack off being resilient, being determined, being a disruptor at the same time, following status quo and, and being a team player, but at the same time, disrupting in a positive way, creating a team going outside of the box. It's so needed. Um, and I just want to give you kudos for all that you have done thus far in the industry. And we look forward to following you and watching you create your own uh, movies and projects in the future. Uh, continued success and good health to you. And on that note, everyone, thank you for joining us for Breaking the Biz. As we conclude another enriching episode, we hope you found inspiration in the stories shared today. Let's take a moment to honor Yes I Can's role in bringing Breaking the Biz to life. Yes, I Can's commitment to empowering young people with disabilities through education, advocacy, and mentorship shines brightly, paving paths of opportunity and dialogue. This podcast celebrates the organization's dedication to nurturing talent and facilitating impactful discussions. Breaking the Biz is more than a podcast. It's a part of Yes, I Can's broader mission to amplify voices, dismantle barriers, and craft a world that's more inclusive and accessible for everyone. Each episode is a chapter in our shared narrative of progress, education, and empowerment, driven by the spirit of Yes, I Can. Thank you for spending your time with us on Breaking the Biz. Continue to challenge the status quo and share stories that resonate. Until our paths cross again, let's keep transforming aspirations into achievements and infuse every endeavor with optimism. Here's to advancing the landscape of the entertainment industry one episode at a time. I'm your host, William Felber. See you next time.